lip balm set. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. So nice to see you. Give it up for Matt FX. Woo! <laughs> DJ. And uh, welcome to the green space and welcome to Generator Live. Hello. Oh my gosh. I'm like freaking out. I'm so excited about this show. <sighs> Today is going to be so good. Um, happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy 2020. I hope uh, your New Year's have been happy and relaxed so far, except in the macro, obviously. <laughs> what? You know what I mean? Huh? You know what I mean? Um, I don't even know. I'm not even going to like fully go into it, but uh, what's going on? You know what I mean? Um, I don't, I'm not even going to like attempt to say anything about Iran. I'm just like, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, and then... And also, the, it's so scary to uh, watch Australia burn in this way. It is so scary. Um, I just, we just saw this word, ecocide, uh, that we were texting about in our group text, our generator um, Instagram DM thread. <laughs> uh, I'm 32, did you know? Uh, <laughs> millennial. <laughs> um, and uh, ecocide, it really feels like that's what's, what that is. It, sound, it sounds right. And... Um, you know, here at Generator, we're about humanizing policy. And as scary as that shit is, it's gonna change only with policy. So um, thanks for joining us uh, tonight to try to humanize and understand policy. And we also want to um, define minimal civic engagement and embody that. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, Generator was founded to gather and talk about politics and government without feeling stupid uh you know it, it feels like in like talking head stuff on the news on like the 24-hour news cycle people have if you ha like they have like an artillery of um facts or something and you just like steamroll someone with your facts that you gathered that already support your you know cause or whatever um and here at generator it's like we're like i don't know i don't know everything that's going on i don't know about government like i want to but it takes so much education to learn about how the system works. And it shouldn't, it should be, it should be um, accessible and understandable, but it's like purposely made elusive. So it's really nice to be together in light of all these um, scary things that are happening. It's really nice to be together in this context. Thanks. Shabbat shalom, yes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, okay, so Generator is a two-part collective. Uh, we are made of the URL and the IRL. <laughs> um, <laughs> clever, clever. <laughs> um, marketing speak, you know. Um, so the IRL is two parts. This is one of the IRL in real life events that uh, Generator is. We sit and we talk and I ask questions and I asked them a second time because it's not always enough <laughs> to get it, to hear it once. Um, and then our other IRL component is Jenny Socials. They are sick dance parties that we throw uh, while also sharing information about upcoming elections. It's hot and nerdy. <laughs> Which is like the hottest to me, okay? Uh, and our URL experience again this is like sort of like our lingo you know what i mean but like i'm like your url what is it user what does it stand for lol you don't even know doug <laughs> doug is our like founding board member and he like knows all like the high level sort of marketing um how to deliver the message to the people but url is now just sort of a symbol of meaning online so generator is part online movement um we are this online movement that is two camera videos that lives on instagram and instagram stories um, we have like a format uh, for these generator videos and sometimes you can make them yourself if you have enough agency. Honestly, it's, it takes a little uh, agency to do it and be like, okay, I'm gonna say something about the government to my Instagram people, whatever. Um, and then another way to get it done is get her done, Jeff Foxworthy, whatever. Um, <laughs> another way to get her done is Jenny with a frenny, which is just making a generator video with a friend. Um, would anybody like to experience this with me? I'll Jenny with a frenny you. Like, no pressure. Yeah, come on. First and only, you know what I mean? So, of course you're going to be, <laughs> of course you're going to be selected. 
Oh, you know what we, oh, thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, Hi, how are you? I'm good. What's your name? Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Olivia. Nice to meet you. Hi. 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 Oh, my God. Um, oh, my God. How old are you? Oh I'm 18. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> yes, Gen Z showing up for civic engagement. Thank yeah. you. That is so cool. So you're like a city kid? Yes, I live here. I grew up in Brooklyn. Cool. That's yeah, so cool. I'm in college now. Awesome. On break. How's it going, college? Great. I mean, yeah. I'm a freshman. It's like scary, because at first when you're in college, you're like, what? You know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, what is this? So different than high school. It's kind of like um, like party camp. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, are we just like having yeah. a slumber party all yeah. year? You know, And it's then weird. like, also intense academia. <laughs> yeah. You're like cramming for finals or whatever. Um, it's intense. So, okay, Olivia, thanks for like volunteering to do this. It is brave and cool of you. Um, so I'm going to prompt you, and we'll make a Jenny with a Frenny, and okay. uh, you guys will see what that format looks like, and you're going to be like, okay, this is cool, and you'll want to partake, hopefully. Okay, Olivia. What's your name? Uh, my name is Olivia Matz. Where are you right now? I am in the green space Woo! in Manhattan. What's something you love? I love plants. Yes! <laughs> Do you have a favorite? Um, I really like bleeding hearts. Oh, cool. And yeah, oak trees. That's all trees. Awesome. I mean, all trees. All trees. Yeah, awesome. All trees. Um, Olivia, what's one um, thing that seems messed up with the system to you? Um, they, there's a cycle of poverty that is not being, and like, it's not being worked hard on hard enough to be broken. And people are stuck in low paying jobs, not having enough time to um, get things done and take care of their families and pay bills, pay health care. Amazing. Um, yeah. That's a, an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now, yeah, give it up. That was amazing. You were so smart and cool. <laughs> Um, okay, so I just want to tag you appropriately because what is Instagram if you're not going to be tagged? It's nothing without being tagged. Um, so what's your Insta? It's olive, O-L-I-V underscore oil dot underscore. Olive oil. Olive oil. Dot underscore. You kids are crazy. Yeah. Like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That first one? Dope. Yeah. Olive oil. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Great thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay, that was like, that. it takes so little to be inspired and to be like, the youth know what's up! It's so exciting. Oh my God. Thanks, Olivia. That brightened everyone's day and week. Thank you. Whew, cool. So that's Jenny with a Frenny. That's what making a gener generator video is, and um, it's easier with a friend and prompts. And then, of course, you tag generator, and you tag the person. And generator gets it in their Instagram stories and hashtags it into policy. So we like to um, discuss government and politics at a very light level, like no big deal, and in real time, uh, see how policy affects our everyday lives. So that was great, Olivia, thanks so much. Yeah, give it up. That's, that was like really brave and cool, amazing. Oh, we are not doomed, you know? That's all it took, that's all it took. Okay, cool, all right. So um, tonight's show is, uh, or event, I don't really even know what we're calling it these days. Show, yeah, cool, it's, I love it, thank you. So tonight's show, thank you, um, is just a really special, a special one. I, I'm so thrilled that we have these guests to really explain to us, these experts to explain to us um, how the system of voting is being perverted. I like have a feeling that it is, I'm pretty sure it's really bad. But I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know exactly how, especially at the, like the logistical and real level. Um, and I'm really excited that we get the chance to explore it deeper. Um, so I wanna say a big thank you to Mother Jones for collaborating with us on this event. They really helped us. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> cool ass Mother Jones. Um, so, I'm gonna um, just intro our, our two guests. Our first guest is, um, oh, and I wanna specifically thank Bridget. Where's Bridget? Hey, Bridget, thank you. Bridget really helped us put this together. Oh, and this is our Mother Jones vibe. Yes, thank you guys, thank you. Um, so uh, one of our guests tonight is a friend of Generator's, an old friend of Generator, um, Ari Berman. 
He is our North Star of understanding voter suppression. Uh, he's written for The Atlantic, Mother Jones, and The Nation. He's been interviewed on NPR, Democracy Now!, and all the good ones. Um, and Ari wrote a book, Give Us the, ba the Ballot, Give Us the Ballot by Ari Berman, and it's going to be in the lobby for sale, and he's going to sign it, if you so choose. Um, uh, Ari digs into voter suppression in an understandable way, which is, um, has been such a gift to Generator and our community. So our other guest tonight, I'm like freaking out. I can't believe we have him. And I'm, uh, yeah, it's just an honor to have Eric Holder. Oh, give it up. Oh my goodness. Tonight is so legit it, it I can't believe it, you know? Um, so Eric Holder uh, served as President Obama's Attorney General. I gotta like just tell you like some of the the accolades first. So he served as a judge of the Superior Court for DC. I don't know what that is, but it sounds amazing, obviously. I'm like Superior Court for the District of Columbia, you know? Um, President Clinton appointed him as the United States Attorney for DC. Again, what is that? It sounds powerful and like huge. Um, and he was President Obama's Attorney General, his first Attorney General, uh, served as um, his senior legal advisor for President Obama, and he founded the National Dem Democratic Redistric Redistricting Committee. Oh my gosh, I'm going to say it again because I, I flubbed it. He founded the National <laughs> Democratic Redistricting Committee. Um, I, I like posted this on Instagram that Eric Holder is kind of like the Superman of exposing and hopefully correct uh, correcting voter suppression. Um, tonight we're going to learn about how deep it goes and try to understand how we can be more aware of it and potentially change it. Uh, let's get our guests on stage. Give it up for Ari Berman and Eric Holder. Mugs. Enamel glasses. Uh, Alana, yeah, they are nice. Where'd you get that picture of me? Um, Am I, I'm better looking than that. I mean, no, I like that picture. That looks like my father. No. <laughs> and he's been deceased for about 15 years. No, I thought it was. Um, I thought it was like a. This was a badass flyer. Look at you guys. I love it. Uh, right. Thanks to TBWA and Doug Melville for that. Um, yeah, give it up for TBWA. Love it. So. Um, Eric, you're, you're, uh, you say that your job is to make uh, redistric redistricting sexy. Yeah. And we're hoping to contribute to that in our own particular brand <laughs> um, tonight. But before we dive into that, I just want to like, talk to you guys as like dudes or whatever. Not like <laughs> dudes, you know, I just mean like human beings. Um, so, okay, from your bios, what's something I like, wouldn't know about either of your careers? Come on, Ari. The, the first people I ever interviewed as a journalist was Method Man and Red Man. <laughs> Give it up. That's really cool. Method Man and Red Man. I don't know. You dig those guys. Yeah. You have something in common with them. What? Smoking weed? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. That's right. I was like... I was like 15 years old in Milwaukee, and I went backstage and like 15, 15, yeah. So I mean, beginning of big things, I guess. And Method Man had this blunt that was about this big, and I was like, oh my god, what is? What's going? My mind was blown. Did he make you like smoke it? No, he was like, who is this little kid? Yeah, literally a child. <laughs> Get cool. this kid out of here. Cool, yeah. a child. But he gave me, me the interview. That's cool. And Red Man was kind of in various states of consciousness, but he was wow. there too. Okay, that's a great fact. Um, Eric Holder, what about you? Uh, I don't have anything that's drug related. Um, <laughs> no. No, no. But I think it's somewhat interesting. When I was, uh, I think, about 12, 13 years old, um, I lived on 24th Avenue and 101st Street in Queens. And uh, my brother came running into a, a candy store where we used to go on uh, 23rd Avenue and said, hey, Cassius Clay is in front of Malcolm X's house. Now, Malcolm X lived on 97th Street. 
I ran out of the candy store, and um, there standing and signing autographs was then Cassius Clay, who later obviously became Muhammad Ali, while he was signing autographs for us. Malcolm X was standing in the doorway <laughs> looking at us, and um, it was right after Cassius Clay had won the title from Sonny Liston. He not actually used his, uh, his, his the name we all know him by now, Muhammad Ali, and um, at, that, at the weigh-in, at the first fight, his heartbeat had gone up very high. People thought he was afraid of Sonny Liston. And so smart-ass, skinny, small, Eric said to uh, him, I said, hey, were you scared? <laughs> <laughs> and he was the largest human being I'd ever seen. He took his hand like this, put it in my face, and said, what do you think? <laughs> oh! And in my voice, which was at the in the process of changing, I guess, I went, no. <laughs> So that's not wow. in any of my official biographies. but That's uh, really cool. It should be. That is sick. Yeah, yeah. That is American as hell. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Thank you for that. And my mother threw away the um, Cassius Clay autographed. Oh, man. Very Marie Kondo, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have the memory of the story, but, yeah. but that does suck. Yeah. It does. <laughs> um, how are your guys' days? Uh, my day's been good. We um, were up here to raise some money for the NDRC, and we were successful. We had a good afternoon, raised a pretty substantial amount of cash, Great. and uh, that's a good thing. Congratulations. And uh, I'm glad to be here, hanging out with uh, all of you. I'm always good to be home. This is, uh, this is my hometown. Sick. Yeah. That's awesome. Amazing! And Ari, how about you? How was your day? Uh, I spent an hour on the phone trying to cancel uh, my internet. And cool. then I <laughs> tried and failed to renew my daughter's passport. So Fun. let's just say the day is starting now, okay? My <laughs> day is starting when I walked in <laughs> yeah. and saw you good. two. Then it was good. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, cool. So, uh, you know, just as we understand it, uh, just to talk about what to expect for the evening, um, Eric, you're, you know the system from the bottom up as a person, as a just person in the world, and then also as someone who climbed his way up the legal you know, career ladder, mm -hmm. and from the top down, because you've been in government for so long. You really uh, must have, you just have a strong, uh, that angle. And Ari, you've been studying voter suppression in like the experiential way, you know, it, like as we understand it, yes, on the systematic level, but like the human experience level. Um, so we hope to really cover the full vibe tonight. And um, for you guys, uh, our audience is chill, okay, um, <laughs> smart and humble and uh, hot nerds, I think. Uh, we're like sexy <laughs> nerds who like want to learn, you know what I mean, and be civically engaged. Um, but not too much, you know, <laughs> but enough. And uh, we're just trying to build out our toolbox for okay. minimal civic engagement. Um, so, voter suppression 101. What is voter suppression? Let's be real. It's like, I know, okay, but like, what is it? You know. I mean, I think you can, you can define it narrowly, which is voter suppression is preventing people from voting. And I think you can define it broadly and historically, which is excluding people or making it difficult for people to participate in the political process altogether. And I think it really goes back to the history of the country. I've been spending a lot of time um, researching the Constitution and looking at a lot of the original debates about what kind of democracy we were going to be, how democratic were we, were, were we going to be. And if you look back at our founding period, um, when 55 people signed the Declaration of Independence, they said all men are created equal. We'll leave out the fact that they excluded women. They said all men are created equal. It's, it's so It's kind of a big exclusion. Rude. Yeah. It is but. so <laughs> rude. The people who make the people. Right. It's so rude. Okay? Right. Right. I'm angry. So uh, <laughs> just gotta say it's so, okay. so, so rude. Okay. They said Go on. <clears throat> Sorry. They said all men are created equal, right? But they didn't believe that all men or all women should be able to vote. That voting rights were mainly the domain at the beginning, and for a long time, of white male property owners, which means a whole lot of people in this room would not have been able to vote for a very long time in this country. A lot of poor white people who didn't own property wouldn't be able to vote. Um, black men didn't get the right to vote until the 15th Amendment in 1870. And then they had that right 
for a very brief period of time, and then it was essentially taken away from them by poll taxes and literacy tests and grandfather clauses and all the things that made up the architecture of Jim Crow and white supremacy in the South. Women didn't get the right to vote till 1920 with the 19th Amendment, which we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of this year. But then again, it was largely white women that were voting at the time. So really, we didn't really have an affirmative right to vote, and we still don't really have an affirmative right to vote, but we didn't have a broad conception of voting rights until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. Uh, and you know, as you well know, Eric, for the next 50 years, they've been trying to roll that law back. So when you think about the fact that America's really only been a functioning or a semi-functioning democracy for a little over 50 years, you realize how fragile all of this stuff really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that, to be frank, this is a nation that has always grappled with um, issues of class, of race, of gender, and um, you see that exhibited certainly in who has the right to vote, um, who has the ability to cast um, a ballot. It is something that, as Ari said, was uh, doled out very sparingly when the nation was founded, this notion of all men are created equal. There was a whole bunch of men who looked just like me who had absolutely no rights, who were actually the property of those people um, who could vote. And since that time, um, it has always been a, a push and pull between um, people getting the right to vote um, and then being prevented from getting to the polls, making it difficult for people um, to vote, always with the notion that you are trying to prop up, in my view, um, the status quo, the establishment, um, those people with power, um, trying to keep us away from, um, from real power in deciding the fate of the nation, the direction of the nation, the policies that are, are, are put in place. And so the battle that we fight now um, is different but has its roots in battles that have been going on around uh, the right to vote since the inception of this nation. And it's like, you know, keeping the right to vote or keeping the power in a few people's hands, I feel like the consciousness is changing. You know, like that was so dope to get Olivia's um, uh, Jenny with a friendy. Because I, I feel like younger people are like, wanting, um, why not just collect the data? We're such a data-based culture now. Why not just collect the data, which is everyone's vote, to see what, would make would work for the most people. The the concept is becoming outdated. The more uh, global consciousness grows. The the problem is we're not approaching voting as forensic scientists and saying what can we do to get a hundred percent participation or looking at it like a doctor battling a disease and saying mm -hmm. how can we kill all the germs. You know we're we're looking at some people trying to get more people to participate, but a lot of people don't want more people to participate. So we have a lot of the tools that we need to increase voter turnout. There's a lot of things that we could be doing to make it easier to vote. I'll just give you one example. Um, we could just automatically register everyone to vote in the same way right. that I am automatically enrolled in the selective service if there would ever be another draft. I mean, the, the government just has that information. They automatically sign me up. I mean, we could do the same thing, and it would be a whole lot better if people were automatically registered to vote. And I should mention, 16 states now have automatic registration. The New York legislature is going to pass it this week. Wow. So there, there That's is... awesome. Whew. There's some momentum. But I mean, you s saw this as attorney general. Mm -hmm. Like, you could do it, but people don't want it done. No, I mean... And let me, I don't want to get partisan right off the bat. It's okay. Well, let's get yeah, real. Go ahead. Let's get oh, well. real. Democrats want as many people to vote as is possible. We want to have, make it easy for people to vote, um, you know, whether it's vote by mail, whether it's, you know, extended voting periods. Um, Republicans, at least this iteration of the Republican Party, has made a determination that they want to restrict the number of people who get access to the polls. Um, you know, younger folks, eh, let's keep those numbers down. Uh, people of color, uh, let's keep those folks down. People who have progressive um, ideas, ideology, let's keep, let's make it difficult for them. And so what we're battling through, we battle through certainly during the Obama years, and, and as I said, this is something that's been going on um, since the beginning of the nation, and especially, you know, since Ari's point is, I think, a good one. 1965, Voting Rights Act is passed. That's the crown jewel of the civil rights movement. Um, you, you know, John Lewis, who's now battling, um, obviously, a very serious illness, got his skull cracked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and people know that. 
but people don't know that that march was for the right to vote. Three civil rights workers, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, killed in Mississippi in 1963. Well, people know that, but why were they? They were down there to register people so that they would have the right to vote. So we've been fighting for this right to vote, fighting against, as I said, you know, the establishment, the, the power, and the Republican Party um, has now identified itself as uh, a party that I think is concerned about having too many people vote because their policies won't attract sufficient numbers of people to win at the polls, and so they're gonna try to pick their voters instead of having voters decide who their representatives um, are, are gonna be. And that's what I'm bound and determined to uh, not let happen. Like, I guess it's just the battle of the two sides. I want, I want to ask, but I, it doesn't even make sense. It's like, you know, it gets, something gets passed, like the Voting Rights Act, and then they're spending most of their time fighting it. You know, when you're talking about like after an, the 1880s or something, black men can vote, and then it's quickly taken away. It's like, how does it even get through? The good fight for a sec, and then most of the people are litigious. You know what I mean? Like they're what? Most of the, what does it look like at the politician level? Well, you know, it, they're, they're ebbs and flows, you know? Um, civil, civil war is, is fought. 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment are passed that fundamentally transforms the nation. And as Ari says, for some short period of time, newly freed um, people had the ability to vote. And you saw black folks representing southern states in Congress, in the Senate. Um, <laughs> the old power elite said, whoa, you know, we're not happy with this, so let's come up with ways in which we can make it more difficult. Um, you know, these felon disenfranchisement laws that we have now, convicted of a felony, you can't vote, that's where they're, that's where it all starts. You know, we got all these black folks voting, so we'll say, all these black men voting, so let's say something neutral on its face, felons, ex-felons can't vote. All right, that's, all right, that, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Well, then we'll just arrest a whole bunch of black men and disenfranchise them that way. Civil rights movement occurs, um, a whole series of gains made there, the 65 Voting Rights Act, 64 Civil Rights Act. Um, again, very positive. And then the establishment, the power elite fight against um, that, have been trying to disassemble that. And I have to say that um, complicit in that has been the Supreme Court, historically, over the years. You look at a whole series of Supreme Court decisions, um, not th the last of which was the Shelby County versus Holder decision that gutted the Voting Rights Act of, uh, of 1965. I think the, the vote has always been about power. Yeah. And that's why it's so powerful, and that's why it's so contested, because both sides are aware of the power that it has. Those that don't have it have clamored for it above all other rights. Uh, the civil rights movement knew that it was the most important of all the rights they were gonna win was the right to vote, because that would be the one thing they could use to tangibly change people's lives. And those that had power knew that the vote was the one thing that could cause them to lose power. And that's why they have tried so incessantly to entrench themselves historically. And there's been very brief periods in our country's history, um, right after the Civil War, uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, when there was some degree of consensus. There was never total consensus, because you always had, you had the people in the South that lost the Civil Wars were called redeemers, right? So they wanted to redeem the old Confederacy. So their minds were never really changed. And in the Civil Rights Movement, a lot of white Southerners, their minds were never really changed. It was done over their objections, but nonetheless, the country as a whole had a national consensus, this was wrong. Slavery couldn't go on any longer. People like John Lewis couldn't be getting their heads bashed in on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That couldn't be who we were as a country. But that consensus never really lasted. And one of the problems was that in the Constitution, there is no affirmative right to vote. There are things you can't do. Right. You can't theoretically prevent people of color from voting. You can't theoretically prevent women from voting. You can't theoretically prevent people who are over 18 from voting. But if you pass a law and you say, oh, I didn't pass this law to disenfranchise African Americans or Latinos or women, but that has the effect, mm. that's where things get dicey. And that's the kind of thing we're seeing today, where you pass a law to require ID to vote, right? And everyone says, well, that doesn't seem racist. But you dig in and you realize that some groups of people lack the forms of ID more than others. And it hits certain people harder. And in fact, that's the intent of the law. 
but it takes a little bit of peeling back the onion to realize that that's what's going on. So, okay, like, I, I, I hear this. Do you think that, um, don't you feel like this, the coded nature, the coded uh, systematic oppressive nature of these laws is starting to be exposed where we're able to hold it more than like, when I was a kid, I don't know, like the 90s were so dumb, you know? It's like, it just feels so like dumb now where we, we didn't know, oh, dare led to, it uh, contributed to mass incarceration. Right? Like the dare part. Like, and I'm a kid and I'm like, Officer Nucci's teaching me dare. You know what I mean? Like, and no, I don't know. It didn't seem like the gr- grown ups knew, you know? Or at least in my suburb, my like segregated suburban town. So now it feels like it's more, it's more um, exposed. The layers are more transparent. Do you think that's true? Well, I think in some ways it's more um, apparent, but as, as, as Ari pointed out, a lot of things are done, you know, photo ID. You have to have a photo ID to vote. This has been passed in, in some states. And people say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, you got to show a picture ID. You see, this is what I see all the time. Picture ID to get on an airplane. Why shouldn't you have a picture ID to, to vote? Well, first off, you know, you don't have the right to get on an airplane. You have the right to vote. So that, there, is, there is that fundamental difference. Um, but then as you peel it back, you find that, um, and you have to peel it back. Um, you find that, well, you say, everybody's got a driver's license. No, everybody doesn't have a driver's license. And that poorer folks, people of color, tend not to have um, driver's licenses. Or you look at the law in Texas that said, well, if you have a concealed carry permit and you have that on a card, that's fine. It's good photo ID. If you're a student at the University of Texas, state-issued photo ID, that's not good. Right. Oh, you know, what does that tell you? Again, peeling it back. And so it's not... um, it's not as obvious as it seems, and that is in some ways the genius uh, and the insidiousness of um, these measures that have been put in place to try to maintain power for a party that I think is, in essence, a minority party when it comes to its views, but yeah. it wants to retain power in spite of those minority views. We learned that fact about, in Texas, the school ID versus gun ID mm-hmm. from Ari uh, another time that he was on the show, and I was like losing my mind. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I couldn't, yeah. I could not believe it. It's like, it's like they waste, the system is designed to like waste poor people's time out of uh, voting and thus self-actualizing, I, I think, guess. but I think to what you were saying earlier, how issues feel deeper now. I think the election of Barack Obama and the election of the first black president really brought out the best and worst of the country. And I think a lot of us saw Barack Obama, the first black president, Eric Holder, the first black attorney general, and all of those firsts, and thought that this would be the new normal. And remember that the coalition that elected Obama was known as the coalition of the ascendant. Young people, women, African Americans, Latinos, this was going to be the future of American politics. This was a rising tide that you couldn't hold back. And what we weren't prepared for, and what I think we should have been prepared for from studying American history, was all the dark stuff that would come with that, the backlash that would come with it. And that's when I started covering voting rights. And that's when I really became aware of voter suppression, was when Republicans took over all of these states like Wisconsin and North Carolina and Pennsylvania. And it wasn't all that different than when Democrats in the 1880s started taking over Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia after the Civil War. And they said, we're going to redeem the Old South. And for the Republicans in 2010, it was, we're going to redeem white supremacy, our own version of it. We're not going to call it that. We're not going to talk like that. But we are going to maintain by any means necessary conservative white power. We don't want Eric Holder to become the new normal. We don't want Barack Obama to become the new new normal. We want Donald Trump to become the new normal. And that's why I think to understand Trump, you have to go back to what was done after Obama's election and the fact that his citizenship itself was being questioned because that laid the groundwork for what we're dealing with now. Right. And also it's like nobody, they, you know, they had him on TV right? It was like, this guy's nuts or whatever, but it wasn't like taken seriously as a real threat. Or, or maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. Um, didn't he just seem, it just some, seemed like clown-like and not for real. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, uh, I will say that in, I guess, the summer before, I guess after he announced, 
I remember watching Trump and thinking, oh, it was good theater. It was good right. TV. But did I think Trump was going to be the Republican nominee? Did I think Trump was going to be the, the president of the United States? You know, of course not. It was just kind of good f fun, you know. And uh, <laughs> we needed to take him more seriously um, than we did. We're also dealing with an electoral system. Let's not forget, you know, 2.8 million more Americans said, we want Hillary Clinton. Right. to be president than, right. than Donald Trump. That's right. And so we've got an electoral college that um, also doesn't necessarily disenfranchise people, but can, can skew things. Um, you know, I guess two of the last, what, five elections, whatever, have been decided by the electoral college as opposed to the, the popular vote. That has a lot of its roots in um, the, the terrible, one, part of, one terrible part of our, our beginning, you know, the, the three-fifths compromise and all that, 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 we don't need to get into all that, but that all, that it's, it's, you know, it's rooted there as well. So are there any number of mechanisms that are, are put in place to prevent us from being a true and pure democracy, you know, where the people decide um, the direction of the country? It's always funny to me when people are fretting about Trump's re-election, mm -hmm. I think rightly so, but if we had a popular vote election, there would be no doubt that Donald Trump would lose. We would be debating how much he's gonna lose by. Right. Is he gonna lose by two million or three million or five million votes? But we would be sure he would lose. But now it's, can he win 20,000 votes in Wisconsin? Can he win 10,000 votes in Michigan? Can he win 40,000 votes like, in Pennsylvania? And that's the system we're living in. And, and so if you understand a, a lot of the institutional problems, in our democratic system, you understand why in many ways our democracy is so screwed up today. Like, what is the Electoral College? <laughs> what and why? And is there, um, is it forever? You know what I mean? Like, it, what, what is it? it? Like, I get it, but I'm also like, what? So I've been reading a lot about this too recently. I mean, basically, the founding fathers didn't know how to pick a president. I mean, that, that was essentially it. Or they didn't like a lot of the alternatives. So they were worried that a that a a popular vote would hurt small states, and they were worried that a popular vote would hurt more importantly slave states, yeah. because Virginia and Pennsylvania at the time those were these were two of the largest states in the country in 1787, they had roughly the same population, but Virginia had 400,000 slaves that didn't have the right to vote, so if you had a popular election, Pennsylvania, which was a free state, where whites voted with free blacks, one of the only states in which African Americans were able to vote mm -hmm. in the 1790s. Pennsylvania was gonna have a whole lot more clout than Virginia, which was a slave state. But if you had the Electoral College, and it was based, and electors were based on the Senate, which was built to favor small states, because every state got two senators regardless of population, and reflected the House, where there was a three-fifths compromise where slaves are counted as three-fifths of people, where then both the small states and the slave states had a whole lot more power in the electoral college than they would have had if we just had a popular vote election. So the same biases that we're talking about today were in large part why we had the electoral college in the first like, place. It's a total, it's a totally buffer, yeah. right? Like when, you're, when you're, you're saying it, it's the same... It's just like they built a buffer to make sure that landowning white men retained the, the most well, power. Well, if you look vote. at the Federalist Papers, Basically, they yeah. talk about the Electoral College as a check on you know, the, the popular vote out of concern that you know, these people who are not maybe extremely well-off, just regular people might make a wrong decision. Put a buffoon, for instance, in the White House. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, this is what they say, you know, and they say, so the Electoral College will act as a check. The people will cast their votes, and if the thing doesn't turn out the way it should, if somebody who is unqualified, um, you know, has narcissistic personality disorder, um, you know, who's a weird hairstyle, if the, a person like that is selected, the electors can then come up with a way in which they will reverse the will of, uh, of, of the people. And it's like the... Didn't work, you know? Yeah. The Electoral College didn't, didn't really work uh, right. three years ago. The Founding Fathers, it's almost like they wanted to be remembered for like a cool idea of equality, but never lived to have to actually give their power up. They, they wanted everyone to think 
that, that they were like groovy yeah, and progressive. That, that they, were, they want everyone to think that what they cr were creating was this great democratic experiment. But in fact, it was in many ways a system to check democracy rather than expand it. Well, you know, I'm not sure I go that far. I, 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 give, I want to stand up for the founding fathers here just a bit in, in the <laughs> sense I, that... I appreciate it because I'm like, I, who are I, these guys? Yeah, and yeah. I, they, I think they were generally well-intentioned, but a lot of this is the product of compromise. Um, trying to get, you know, uh, 13 states to, you know, uh, of, vote for the Constitution, and therefore you had to look out for the interests of the small states, look out for the interests of, you know, be frank, the, the slaveholding states, and they made a series of compromises that made sense perhaps at the time, maybe probably didn't, but certainly have no business being in the way in which we govern ourselves in the 21st century. Right, because it's like, I'm like, I guess it's groovy compared to a monarchy at the time. Right. But... It's not chill anymore. Yeah, I mean, and no one had ever done this before. I mean, that's why right. we've amended the Constitution right. so many times. Right. Um, but there's a lot of stuff we haven't put in the Constitution right. that we probably need to. Like we said, we don't have an affirmative right to vote in this country. We don't have an affirmative ability to ban gerrymandering, as far mm -hmm. as we know, um, in the Constitution. We can do it piecemeal, X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z, but we don't have... Other countries have much more blanket protections. Mm -hmm. Other countries have, uh, have much more modern constitutions, constitutions that are a lot easier to amend, and constitutions that are much more protective of basic rights than we are. We got some basic things right in the beginning, things within the Bill of Rights, basic things like freedom of speech that well, we all know broad about. broad theoretical right? ideas. Mm -hmm. But we haven't been that great about updating it since. Um, so you brought up gerrymandering. Uh, I wanna talk about gerrymandering and redistricting. Again, it's like I get it pretty much, but what is gerrymandering? You're good. You, That's you. You, you know, no, you, you're okay. good. Well, you right. good with the I'll definition. Start. Okay. You know, I have. I, I come, mean, I come with the anecdotes. Yeah, that's so right. I, I, the <laughs> way Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, you know, <laughs> get all the good stories. <laughs> <laughs> I had Method Man and Red Man, and you had Muhammad Ali. I mean, that was the trump card. Oh my God. <laughs> if we were playing poker, I would have lost. Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, redistricting is something that happens every ten years. That is mandated by the Constitution, which is that we've done it. Um, we've con we conduct a census every ten years to figure out how many people live in the country, and then we draw districts to reflect that population. And so, there's nothing inherently wrong with redistricting. It's how you do it. Right. Gerrymandering, as I think of it, is the manipulation of redistricting. It's drawing districts to incentivize one group or one party at the expense of another. And instead of doing it in a fair way, doing it in, in some way to try to manipulate the lines that are drawn to advantage a certain group of people. Yeah, redistricting, re redistricting is normal, like should be normal, if yeah. not... Perverted. It's mandated by the Constitution. We have a census every 10 years. It'll be in 2020. It'll be start this year. 2021, on the basis of the census, we do the redistricting. Under the Supreme Court decisions, you know, one man, one vote, one person, one vote, um, you'd think that districts should generally be drawn in fair ways, you know, have roughly the same number of people. And they do, but you can draw the lines in such a way. You can manipulate the maps in such a way so that you put maybe all the Democrats in one district and then you don't have Democratic representation in all the other districts. And Republicans can therefore win more districts than perhaps they are entitled to. When I said draw them like this, actually they're not drawn in kind of concentric circles or geographic shapes. They're drawn in all kinds of weird ways so that you capture. Um, that's called packing people together. Or you can crack, which is to disperse a certain group of people in such a way that you diminish um, their power. One of the lawsuits we brought in, in Pennsylvania was to declare unconstitutional a, um, a district that was called Daffy Duck Kicking Goofy. <laughs> Seriously, and if you look at it, you see the two Disney characters. The only thing that connects them is, uh, you know, I guess Goofy's shoe and another part of uh, the nether parts of Donald's. Um, <laughs> anatomy, and that's the thing that connects them. But it looks like two figures. But it was done in such a way um, to reduce the power of, of Democrats in the 10th district, con Wait, 10th I just, congressional district. just this image. <laughs> I just want to like, hang on for a Google it. You need to put that on Instagram. Go Google it. You'll see it. And yeah. it, did it happen to look like these Disney characters? No, it, it did. That's it does. why they called it that. Yeah. I know, but or were they like, bro, let's get Daffy Duck? No. No, you no, know no, what I mean? Like. Okay. But it, I'll give you I'll give you an, I'll like give you an ex a really a good example of, of what gerrymandering looks like. So there is a college campus in North, North Carolina, Carolina, North Carolina A and T, 
it's a historically black university and has a lot of significance in the civil rights movement because it's in Greensboro, North Carolina, where the sit-ins began in the 1960s. The first sit-ins began in Greensboro, North Carolina in February 1960 to try to integrate segregated lunch counters. And it was four students from North Carolina A&T that went to Woolworths in downtown Greensboro to integrate that lunch counter, and they were brutally beaten and spit on, and it was a, it was a disgusting affair. But it began the sit-in movement that transformed the segregated South. What Republicans did is they drew a line in half, and they cut North Carolina A and T in half. They cut the college campus in half. So one half of the campus is in one congressional district. Mm. The other half of the campus is in in another congressional district. They did this because it's a majority black campus where the students tend to vote Democratic. So if the students vote as one campus, which would make sense, right? It's not that big of a campus. They would presumably vote for a Democratic congressman. But by splitting it in two, they're doing what Eric called cracking. They are making it so that the black population's votes are diluted. So instead of one Democratic member, there are now two white Republican members representing that area. Wow. That's how gerrymandering works. And that, kind of, that was the map that was just thrown out um, by a state court in North Carolina for being an unconstitutional gerrymander. Was, um, re was gerrymandering like since the Civil War? Like when did it start? We've been gerrymandering in this country for almost as long as we have been um, the a United country. States of yeah. America. Yeah. It's named after a guy named Eldridge Geary, I guess is the it's way it's It's funny, it's Gary, but then you pronounce it gerrymandering. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Who came up... <laughs> uh, gross. Who came but up like with... like ghouls, you know, well, he like drew, he drew a map. college. He was a governor of Massachusetts, Massachusetts in the like, yeah. 1820s, and he Ugh. drew a map that looked like a salamander, and his name was Eldridge Geary, so they called it a... Uh, Gary. Gary and John Oliver had some line like gerrymandering is so fucked up it's not even pronounced right. Um, and and uh, that but is so yeah, so it's gross. been it's been around from the very beginning. And 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 the problem is is that with some exceptions, the states have a lot of latitude mm -hmm. in terms of how they can draw districts. And so you can there's certain <laughs> times you run afoul of gerrymandering, but but I mean you can speak to this better than I can, Eric, but it's, and a lot of the time, very difficult in court to strike down these maps, even when it's so obvious to everyone what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, the, under the civil rights laws, if somebody, if some party tries to gerrymander on a racial basis, and it's difficult to show this, but if you can show that, the courts have said that is unconstitutional. You can't, you can't do that. That violates um, statutes of the United States. Supreme Court has just recently said that if you gerrymander on a partisan basis, partisan, um, that that is not something that is cognizable, is recognized, or suits can be brought in the, in the federal courts. And so for those of us who have been fighting partisan gerrymandering, we have to bring those cases in the, in the state courts. And as Ari said, that case that we won in North Carolina was brought in the state courts under the North Carolina state constitution. But a lot, I want you to understand just how wild this opinion was. I mean, the Supreme Court said, not only are we not going to strike down gerrymandering, right. even though everybody knows what's going on here. I mean, the average person on the street can look at these districts and realize what the purpose of, it's not that complicated. It's goofy, um, daffy duck. Exactly. Um, not only can we not strike down these maps, we can't even review them, which is crazy. I mean, like, the idea that the federal courts would just sit out all together, one of the most important things that we do in our political system that relates to every branch of political power from the House of Representatives to state legislatures to city councils to judges in a lot of cases are elected by districts. The fact that this can't even be reviewed was so crazy and to me so ahistorical. I think it's just between that and I think the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it just really made clear uh, just how really, really deeply radical uh, the, the current Supreme Court is, and now all of these state courts, which I'm curious what you think, are not really prepared to handle all of these cases, suddenly are dealing with all of these, ca these gerrymandering cases because the federal courts say, we don't, we don't believe that there's anything wrong with this and we don't even want to look at it. And people, I think, uh, I hope the audience understands this. You know, gerrymandering sounds kind of ethereal, you know, kind of wonky, and that's why I said when we announced the NDRC, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, I thought it was my job to make redistricting sexy, you know, get people interested, raise, raise people's consciousness about That's this. why we brought Alana here. Yeah. Woo. 
I'm there we go. And um, if you care about a woman's right to choose, if you care about climate, if you care about voter protection, if you care about criminal justice um, reform, if you care about health care, all of these things are directly tied to um, partisan and racial um, gerrymandering, negative impact on all of those issues, because it puts people in power who don't necessarily reflect the desires of the people. And uh, you look at Wisconsin, you look at North Carolina, where you have Democrats, progressives getting you know, substantially greater numbers of votes than Republicans and have fewer people in the state legislatures that draw the lines for the House of Representatives. And we had a couple of instances during the, the 2010s where Democrats got as many as 1.2, 1.1 million more votes than Republicans and had, were at a 33-seat deficit in the House of Representatives, in spite, of, in spite of getting over a million more votes. And it's all a, a way, a result of the way in which the lines were drawn. So who's, who's drawing the lines? And like, who do you wish were reviewing them? Like that they were voted on or something? Well, this, the problem is there's an inherent conflict of interest. I mean, the, the state legislatures are drawing lines for themselves. So this is akin to Dick Cheney leading the vice presidential search and then naming himself vice president. I mean, that's, that's what's going on here. And Gross. so like in, in Wisconsin, in the last election Ugh. for the state House of Representatives, what's called the state assembly, Republicans got 46% of the vote, but 64% of seats, which is just so crazy. I mean, think I mean, of that, 46% of the vote, 64% of the seats. It's like Illuminati numbers too. I'm like, you guys, you are freaking me out. But I think the really, I think the important thing here, and I think the important thing of what, what, what Eric's group is doing, and, and I wrote about this as a plug in, in a recent issue of Mother Jones, is focusing on the states. Because this is something that's really been lost by a lot of people, and honestly, it's been lost by a lot of Democrats. Trump didn't draw the lines in Wisconsin. Trump didn't draw the lines in Pennsylvania. Trump didn't draw the lines in North Carolina. All of this predated Trump, and all of it was done at the state level. And by the way, it's a whole lot easier to vote a state legislator out of office right. than to try to remove a president from office. So even though gerrymandering feels totally intractable at times, it's actually a lot easier to change a state than to try to elect a president. And so I think with, with Democrats and pro progressives now focusing more effectively at the state level, like Republicans said, Republicans when Obama was elected, they, didn't, they obviously wanted to get Obama out of office. But their first thought was, not how are we gonna impeach him, how are we gonna right. defeat him. Their thought was, how are we going to take over the states and nullify his agenda for the next decade? And they've done that. You look at the places they gerrymandered the most, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, et cetera. They're still in control, at least at the state legislative level, in all of those states. Now, that's gonna change in the next cycle, and you could talk about this because They've elected Democratic governors in those states. Democratic governors can veto the maps. Some of the state legislatures could flip, so there are changes. But their plan worked. What they wanted to do worked. It, it's been remarkably effective, uh, and it just shows the power that these tactics have. Yeah, I mean, the Republicans had a thing called Project Red Map, which was designed to come up with the ways in which these um, gerrymanders were drawn. You know, Democrats and progressives, we have focused on, oh, who's president? Who's president? You know, state elections, eh, they're, they're not as interesting. You know, a Barack Obama, oh, yeah, you know. And I understand, you know, that we need to focus on the presidency. And this, all presidential elections are important. This one is of existential importance. I mean, this one matters more than maybe any other election, presidential election of my life. And yet, at the same time, we have got to focus on these state elections. You know, um, and people who have the ability to affect um, how the lines are drawn. In Ohio, the Secretary of State, the State Auditor, these are elections that matter. Um, who serves on the state Supreme Courts if they are elected officials? Those elections matter, and that's where the NDRC lives, to try to generate interest in support for progressive candidates who will stand for um, fair elections. You know, and I'd like to think that this would be something that we could do on a bipartisan basis. Right. Um, but the reality is that um, Republicans understand that if they have fair elections, fairly drawn um, districts, they're going to lose power. Right. That is inevitable. They're going to lose power. Right. And therefore, they stand for the system that they helped put in place in 2011, the last time that we um, redistricted. Now, there are a few Republicans who have you know, stood with us. Arnold Schwarzenegger, 
former governor of uh, California, the Terminator. Um, <laughs> he and I have done a, a couple of things together. We've done some op-eds um, together. We were at an event, I guess, in D.C., and he actually said, Eric and I are going to terminate gerrymandering. <laughs> it's like, okay. That is so <laughs> funny. Well, hey, you know. I, I didn't do the accent very well. Um, but uh, he has been committed to that. And, That's uh, cool. Yeah, and so, but they've been few and far um, between. And I think, as I said, the Republican Party is comfortable with the notion that they're going to be a minority party with majority power. Right. They're okay with that. It's worth pointing out that uh, voters in five states in 2018 right. passed ballot initiatives to try to rein in gerrymandering in some form or another, uh, most notably by trying to have some sort of bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, commission draw the districts. And in, in, in virtually every state, these passed overwhelmingly, 60% or more. So I think, obviously, you know, Republican and some Democratic politicians are very invested in this. I don't think the average voter much likes this. And I think you could put an anti-gerrymandering amendment on the ballot virtually anywhere and it would have a good shot of passing. I think you could pass it in Oklahoma. I think you could pass it. It just passed uh, in Utah. Utah. Um, it just it passed in Utah. It passed in Michigan. It passed in Flo in all sorts of different kind of states with different sorts of politics. So I think this is something where I think where if you can try to bypass the people, uh, you can you can start to get stuff done. And we we already kind of know what the solution is. Like Iowa, where I grew up. We have, we're one of the few states that have a state demographer that just does this. Right. So we think of gerrymandering, we don't really have gerrymandering because a state demographer does it, but we think of redistricting as a science, not as politics. Mm -hmm. And you, you, we think of it as how can you draw the best districts, right? And that seems like that should sort of be the thing that every state is thinking of how, when they do this, not Iowa, how to manipulate it the most. How or why did Iowa do it um, humanely, sanely? I think they had a, I, mean, I think, one thing is it's a very homogeneous state, so that makes it easier. Mm. Um, also, they only have four congressional districts, so you just basically cut the state into four. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. But I also think you know it was also that kind of Midwestern, good government, progressive era um, where you know M Michigan, you know Wisconsin, Minnesota, to some extent Iowa. That's Iowa's becoming more like Missouri now than those other places. Um, but they have these progressive traditions, and they look at government as a vehicle for social good. Mm -hmm. not a vehicle to be manipulated, which is how it's come to be thought of today. Why do we even, I mean, do we even need districts if we voted at a popular level within the state? And we took a census and we were like, oh, this is where the people are for this past 10 years or whatever. But like, why do we even need districts exactly? Well, I think districts make sense, uh, appropriately drawn, make sense so that you look at the, our, our federal system, you, then for, you therefore have um, congressmen who, represent districts. And again, you have very local involvement there. You go a step up, you have senators who represent uh, a state, and then you have a president who represents the nation. And I think that system um, makes, I think- Makes sense. Makes sense. But I don't think the Senate makes sense. Well, well it, it made, again, that's another, another compromise. The federal you know? Senate doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense that Wyoming has the same number of senators as California when California right. has 60 times more people. Right. I mean, I think maybe it was defensible. I don't think it was even defensible in 1787 when Virginia had 13 times as many people as Delaware. I think Madison, Hamilton, a lot of people that we think of as the greatest founding fathers, they were strenuously opposed to the idea of each state's getting two senators, but the small states basically said, we're gonna leave the union. We're not gonna sign the constitution if you don't give us the same amount of power. And so this was, again, one of these compromises. It was more like mm. a concession than a compromise, right. um, a fatal concession. Um, because right now, if you look, I just read a stat. Yeah. This Senate, the, the US Senate could be controlled by as little as 18% of the population. 18% of the public Jesus. representing living in places like Wyoming. Um, and I don't, no offense to those states, those are beautiful states. Um, but they shouldn't have the same amount of power as a place like California. Well, it's like or New in York. individuals, citizens should all have the same amount of power. Yeah. And That's we, what. And we have a thing in the Constitution um, called one person, one vote. And th these were among the most important cases in the 1960s because what was happening um, before the one person, one vote cases like in you know, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s is districts were just drawn in such a crazy way that like a representative, someone like representing a district with 14,000 people would have as many representatives as a district with 800,000 people. Like that actually happened um, in, in California 
LA County had the same number of people, the same number of representatives as these three tiny counties that were basically east of the Sierra Madres where nobody lived because the state was so malapportioned. We got rid of that under one person, one vote, but that's essentially what's happening in the U.S. Senate today. I mean, the, both the Electoral College and the U.S. Senate would violate the principles of one person, one vote if they were applied to those institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. Thanks for the one oh person God. clap. Please Slow clap. clap. Drama over there, got it. Um, okay, I have like an embarrassingly stupid question. So I like recently learned through Generator, LOL, that um, the primaries for the president are different in each state rather than, oh, we're all deciding the primaries in like on March, whatever. State Senate elections, state congressional elections, are those all on different days or are those going to be November 2020? No, uh, well, you mean votes for House of Representatives and for United States Senate? And for the state bodies. For the state bodies, state yeah. legislation. Those state are all on, on the, yeah, votes. those are all. The federal offices are all on the same date. Um, there are some states that hold their elections, you know, um, well, no. Off year. Uh, off year. Like, we just had elections in Virginia in, and Louisiana and Kentucky. Those were in November. They were all on the same day, but they right. were off year elections. And then the primary votes Someone's are. whispering something. The primary votes are on, in Mississippi, different. Mississippi, yeah. The you know, primary votes are not all, primaries are not all held at the same time. I mean, you know, in Chicago, they do their, their primaries in the middle of the winter, which is, I think, kind of bizarre. This is nonsense, right? This is just like sort of confusion nonsense? Uh, you know, I, I, I understand, as, I'm not a Chicago historian, but I understand the Daily Machine had something to do with that. You know, if you do it in the middle of the winter, you probably keep the vote relatively low with bad yeah. weather, and then it's it the is. most organized party. It's the machine that can get people out, uh, out to vote. Yeah, primaries are often designed to keep participation low. I mean, in New York, we were a poster child for this. If right. you wanted to vote in the Democratic primary for president in 2016, if you, wanted, if you were not a registered Democrat and you wanted to change your registration because right. we had a closed primary, so only Democrats could vote in the Democratic primary, you had to change your registration nine months before the primary. Who was thinking of whether they were gonna be a registered Democrat nine months before the primary? I think we've now changed that law. Um, or, or in the Was process it the same for Republicans? It. Uh, I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what the Republican was because they're, what was, I don't know, that's a good question. Hmm. When, I mean, New York didn't have, has a lot well, more Democrats still, than Republicans. Just like, you guys yeah, I mean, the, just yeah. for the record, you talk about nine months, I came out of the womb as a Democrat, so, you know, that's yeah. it. <laughs> but um, believe it or not, a lot of young people don't like, I mean, I mean, it's like trendy to be an independent. In New York, a lot of people are registered as Working Families Party because there, it's a fusion right. ticket, the mm -hmm. press ticket. Yeah. So then they're shut out of being able to vote in the Democratic primary. So I mean, we were in many ways the post child. Right. And that's because it was entrenched elites on both sides that wanted to keep participation law that wanted to keep the AOCs of the world mm. from getting power. And so, I mean, it wasn't just a Republican problem. It, in, in New York, especially, it's been a bipartisan problem um, where the, the leaders in both parties haven't wanted to open up the system. Now, one thing that I think has been good is that people think of New York as this very progressive state, um, but it was only recently in the last election that Democrats took over the New York legislature. That's right. And they've been a lot more progressive and forward leaning. And one of the things they did was they purged a lot of Democrats that voted with Republicans and were blocking a lot of progressive change. So New York's passed the a lot IDC, of- The IDC? Yeah, the right? IDC. So New York's passed a lot of progressive stuff now that would have otherwise been blocked. And it, I mean, it's good, like New York has early voting now. Well, 39 states had early voting before New York had it. So I'm glad we've caught up with Texas and Georgia um, in that effect, but it's good. I mean, we, you gotta start somewhere. And I think people say, well, what, what, what does it matter? What does it matter what New York's doing? But first off, it affects a lot of people who live here. Right. Um, but also, it's a model for the rest of the country that when New York doesn't have early voting, right. it's a lot easier for someone in North Carolina to say, why should I have early voting if New York doesn't have it? Right. So let's at least remove that argument mm -hmm. that we, let's, not right. let, let's not let Southern states treat us as a punching bag because we don't have those things that other places have. Right, we've been like fake, fake progressive because we have like a sick pride parade. You know, we're like, we're so progressive. Have you seen it up fifth, down Fifth Ave? And it's like, but you couldn't do early voting. So where's the, that's not cohesive. It's like, we got the credit for, um, you know, I have this, I had this like joke that I cut in my stand-up special that uh, Texas made Beyonce, New York made Trump. <laughs> we're not so progressive. 
You should have kept that joke. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't want to say his name on my thing. You know what I mean? Um, okay. Let's Trump ha- did, I mean, Texas did give us George W. Bush, though, so. And like. In fairness. It's, yeah, it's not great yeah. down there. And it is like, I mean, I love New York, you know, and it is, um, but I just, I want that when, when the state Senate were, was elected Democrat, I didn't even know that it had been 75 years since mm-hmm. we had been <laughs> in control and in power. And um, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, and early voting. I didn't know until really recently when it passed. You know, it's like Trump getting elected had made us all be like, wait a second. Well, and this should be the baseline of what, like early voting, thi- uh, early voting, online voter registration, things like that. That should be the baseline right. of what we have. And then we need to go further. We need automatic registration. We need a- election day registration so you can register at the polls on election day because a lot of states cut off registration 30 days before an election. So there, there are presidential debates mm-hmm. in October in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan. But in a lot of those places, you can't even register to vote. So you could be watching the debate, you could be turning in, tuning in for the first time and you're blocked from registering. Or you could have a problem with your registration. We have this even in New York all the time. I can't tell you how many texts and calls I get every election in New York say, I was purged from the voting rolls. Mm-hmm. For like, maybe it, it may just be because New York's dysfunctional, it may not be intentional, but if you have election day registration, you can fix that kind of stuff. And now New York's going further. New York City now has what's called ranked choice voting. So you don't even just have to pick one person you like. If there's two or three candidates you like, you can rank them. Yeah, what's the, what's the T on ranked choice voting? I think it's good. It's good. I think it's good because, I mean, like, it's good. It, it's, it allows, I don't know what you're I thinking I thought so, is, but, but then I, mean, I if, thought if, I was just, like, believing the hype If you like or multiple whatever, people or you're worried about someone being a spoiler, and you, you can put them as your first choice, but if they don't get enough votes, your votes will be redistributed to someone that's maybe more viable. So you don't have to feel bad about voting your conscience. And, like, if we had ranked choice voting right. in the primary now, people wouldn't have to be, like, going this crazy gnashing over, is Elizabeth Warren electable? Is Bernie Sanders too much of a socialist? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They could just rank them. And if you kind of liked Elizabeth Warren, if you kind of liked Bernie, et cetera, you could just you know, right. rank them and then not be so worried about the outcome. So um, the NDRC, mm-hmm. what do you guys do? Like at the, how, how are you changing things at the one-to-one level? Well, we have... Um, a multi-pronged strategy. We file lawsuits where we can um, use the state laws or the federal laws to challenge um, gerrymandering. And we've been very successful in bringing lawsuits in any number of, uh, of venues. We, for instance, uh, challenged the, tr- the attempt to try to include a citizenship question on the census, because the census is really the foundation for having a fair redistricting process. So we were successful there. We brought lawsuits in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, a whole variety of us. We bring lawsuits. We support candidates who will stand for um, fair redistricting. We have a, a pledge that all the Democratic nominees um, have signed that essentially says they're going to stand for fair redistricting. They're going to raise this as an issue during the course of uh, the, the campaign. Um, we stand also for um, supporting these nonpartisan commissions to take it out of the hands of legislators who are self-interested and put it mm-hmm. in the hands of um, a nonpartisan disinterested commission. Can I uh, ask you about the lawsuits for a second? Yeah. Okay, so like the lawsuits, you're suing the state. Are you like, I don't even know, but are you keeping the like state judges entrenched in this issue such that they're not, for, like, who are you suing? Well, we would sue, for instance, maybe the Speaker of the House in um, North Carolina, the President of the Senate in North Carolina, um, you know, the governor in, of a state, if that's the person who is... Uh, the federal thought, government? Yeah, yeah. We, we, you, you pick, you, you know, you find the plaintiff and you can just... You're basically challenging the system, but you have to name a person um, who you're actually suing, and that person has to have some authority, some control over, um, over the system. And, like, so you're not, like... So you're, you're doing it, it's supposed to be, like they say, they, it can be nonpartisan. They don't claim that it's, ha, like, what do you say? You're like, bro, this is racist. You know, like, how do you, <laughs> oh, yeah. how, you're like, well, this no, is No, because we racist. bring cases on the basis of racial gerrymandering. Those are the cases, for instance, that we brought in Virginia, where um, federal courts found that in, I guess, 11 districts within Virginia, the state, the, the lines were drawn on a racial basis. And the Supreme Court, including Clarence Thomas, said that that is something that is unconstitutional. The lines were redrawn, and as a result of that, for the first time in, I guess, like 40 years, um, Democrats now control both houses in the um, Virginia state legislature. Mm. 
And so we didn't actually style and say, bro, you're racist. That, that <laughs> well, doesn't appear like, in our briefs. I wanted to ask earlier, when you're like attorney general and you're like in, off, in the office with people, are you like, come on, dude, you're doing this. It's Like, do you say to these, you're like co- colleagues, your coworkers, you're like, you know this is so evil. Well, no, you know, and are they like, no, we really believe, like, what is the co- level of conversation? It, it feels so obvious Well, here. you know, you, you, when you're a public, a high-level public official, you really have two personas. And so, you know, if you saw me testifying before committees or giving speeches, you know, that's stiff Eric, you know? <laughs> but if you see me in my conference room talking to people about, you know, whatever... And, you know, the F words are coming out, and shit, you know, that's all Loving, happening. You know, all the, that, that's what happens. There. That's where real Eric shows up. Yeah, uh, loose that's Eric. where New York Eric is, yeah. you know. And so. Challenging uh, Cassius Clay Eric. Yeah, you know, well, yeah. Who's scared? Uh, yeah. I mean, so there's a, you have to have a, this dual personality. I, mean, I actually think that you should respect the office, and when you're in the public sphere, um, conduct yourself in an appropriate way. I don't think this president particularly does that um, extremely well. Um, but, but will you say, will you be like, this just feels like the action is born out of racism? Do you, re- like, would, do you really call it out in well, that yeah, way? yeah, I gave a speech um, in February of 2009. I'd been, I'd been attorney general for about two, three weeks, and I said, and you know, the nation went, ah! Oh. I said, you know, when it comes to, uh, paraphrasing here, when it comes to things racial, this nation has too often been a nation of cowards. Uh, and what I meant by that is that we're afraid to deal with racial issues. And man, you would have thought, I said, everybody go out and like yeah. beat your wife. Right, or, right. Or, kill your mother or something, you know? <laughs> Conservatives were like, oh, how could you say that? And I'm like, because it's damn real. It's you know? so weird how they're like, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I'm like, but you are. Like, it doesn't even make sense. Who are you then? You know what I mean? Um, well, what I mean, are your and, actions and, and you had, if not? Well, and you had, like, you didn't have to call someone racist because you had a power greater than that, which you could block the laws. Right. And I mean, that's the thing that the, the Attorney General now, not that William Barr would do this, but <laughs> if there was to be a more progressive Attorney General, they don't have that power under the voting rights anymore to block was are essentially racist laws because what the Supreme Court said in Shelby County versus Holder um, when you were in office was that those states with the longest histories of discrimination, those states that were being historically the most racist, they didn't have to approve their voting changes with the federal government anymore. So previously, federal courts in D.C. or the Justice Department could block these laws before they even went into effect. And that was, the, I think, one of the greatest powers that you had sure. as Attorney General, one of the greatest powers that you had in all of the Justice Department, probably. Yeah, the 1965 Voting Rights Act gave the Justice Department the ability to say, you know, if you're in a, a southern state or a covered state, because some northern states were covered as well, parts of New York were actually covered, that you're going to move a polling place, you know, um, from location A to location B. And we actually can re- figure out what's going on. You're going to make it more difficult for, uh, for black folks. To, to vote, you say no, you can't do that. You can't do that. So stop it. Um, under the Shelby County decision, that power was taken away from the uh, Attorney General, from the Justice Department, and now, predictably, as uh, Justice Ginsburg said in her dissent in that case, you saw a whole range of um, anti-democratic, um, racist voting changes that went into effect that would have been previously stopped by um, a concerned Justice Department. And you say, well, why should the federal government? look at whether a polling place has moved. Well, since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013, southern and western states have closed 800 polling places since that decision. So, I mean, in in, in and Georgia... And it's not... These closures don't happen uniformly. They happen in right. places where you just happen to see people of color or where you see people who are more likely than not progressive. And so you see the studies that show longer lines in people and in communities of color, mm. uh, all with the notion, again, you're making it more difficult. You have to wait four hours to I'm cast a ballot. just wasting people's ballot. time. It's like time is money, just wasting people's time, taking that money, that well, time. Well, I mean, you think about it. We have them. a system where we cast our votes on, what, the first Tuesday in November? What sense does that make? The first Tuesday in November, as opposed to, all right, let's make, if you're going to make it one day, how about, how about Saturday? Yeah. And not make people choose between casting a ballot and their jobs. Or you make know? it a holiday and make people like stoked to Make vote. it a holiday. But even better than that, how about let's have two weeks of early voting or that you have the ability to cast a ballot at home, voting by mail, That's, which is done in Oregon and is shown not to have any impact with regard to fraud and increases very substantially the number of people who actually vote. Yeah, we, I mean, we vote on a Tuesday in November because that's when farmers used to bring their 
crops to the market in the 1800s. Right. I mean, it's a totally antiquated system. And if you look at what other... And I know you guys are bringing your crops in <laughs> on Tuesday in November, so all I these, apologize. All these urban farmers in right, the audience, right, right. Um, all these modern farmers. What are you but, all growing, but, by um, the way? You know? <laughs> <laughs> we shall yeah. see soon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, like, in other countries... Election day is a, either a holiday or it's on a weekend. Right. Um, everyone is automatically registered to vote and everyone has a national ID card. So you've taken away all of the problems. You've taken away the problems of long lines are being inconvenient to vote. You've taken away the problems of people not being able to register or taken away the problems of people not having the right ID. And that doesn't mean that it's a perfect system in Sweden or, or, or other countries. I mean, Australia has compulsory voting. We're seeing what's happening there right now. But there's a reason why the U.S., consistently ranks near the bottom, if not at the bottom, of voter turnout in advanced industrial democracies. Because all of these other countries do things in a much more sensible way than the way we approach our elections. And not only that, they have federal standards that we don't have. Mm -hmm. So in the, the amazing thing to me was in 2018 when there were all of these problems in Georgia, in the election there, when Stacey Abrams was running to become the first uh, black woman governor in US history, and her opponent, running for governor, Brian Kemp, was also the secretary of state, was essentially overseeing his own election, was putting in place all these laws to try to hurt Abrams and the Democrats. Jimmy Carter, who of course was president but also governor of Georgia and ran the Carter Center, which monitored voting all across the world, he couldn't monitor the election in Georgia because there were no national standards to compare Georgia to. So it's amazing that Jimmy Carter can go to Eritrea and monitor the election, but he can't monitor the election in his home state. Yeah. That's, I don't even know how to <laughs> respond to that. That's grotesque. Um, the NDRC, how can like a normal person be involved? What are you hoping, what's your ideal, what's Eric Holder's ideal, you know, average person's um, contribution to yeah. what the NDRC is doing in 2020? Well, I talked about our, our, our some of the prongs before. Our fourth prong is our all on the line campaign. It's an advocacy program where, um, just regular folks, you know, me, you, get together and um, advocate for um, fair elections. We have, uh, it's a grassroots campaign that has a, a, a website, again, all on the line. You can go look it up, find us there. You can sign up to be involved in this effort. And what's really important about the effort is if you're in New York, and, you know, New York's pretty good. They had some problems, but New York, you know, the problems are not really in New York. The problems are in North Carolina, in, in Wisconsin, in, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, you know, um, Texas. What, what can folks in New York do? Well, we now have a way in which, for instance, you can make calls into Texas to make sure that people are registered to vote, let them know where their polling places are, encourage people to get out and vote. I was in Denver, um, I guess, in, before the, the last election in November of, uh, of 2019, and talking to people there who were calling into Virginia to get people in Virginia um, aware of the fact that it's an off-year election, these are the, um, the, the races that are going to be run, uh, this is where you need to be, what's your address, this is your polling place. Um, so you can sign up for those, those kinds of things. You don't have to travel as long as you're willing to either do something online or, or, or make phone calls. Um, I think we have to see this as not a state-by-state -state problem, but this is a national problem right. because what happens in the states has national impact. And as I said, in those areas that... Um, people care about. People say, again, voting, you know, redistricting, what is that? Yeah, but you care about the right to choose, right? You care about the climate. Um, you care about criminal justice. Reform. Whatever the issue is that you care about, it's all determined by the way in which we um, redistrict, the way in and which we draw the lines. And you something that was really, really important, which is the census. Because that's something that everyone can do. Right. And a lot of people can't vote in this country. They're um, not old enough to vote or they're not a citizen, or they have some sort of criminal conviction that prevents them from voting in certain states. Everyone can fill out the census. The census is really important for people to understand. The census counts everybody. It counts you whether you're young or old, citizen or non-citizen, documented or undocumented. You should be counted by the census. So the census is something that everyone here can do and everyone can encourage other people to do and is really, really critical in New York because diverse states like New York that have um, large immigrant populations, um, large uh, low-income populations, large populations of color, we're at risk of having what's called an undercount, which is we're at risk of not being adequately counted in the census, which means that New York is not going to get as much money, as much political representation in, in, by virtue of the census as we should, because the census determines how $880 billion 
in federal funding is allocated for things like schools and roads uh, and hospitals. The census determines how we draw political districts, and, and it only happens once every 10 years, and it's happening this April. Uh, and I'm concerned because of what the Trump administration is, has been doing. They're like scaring people out of, or und undocumented people out of doing the census, sure. right? Well, I think the, the, just the fact that they, the same administration that was separating parents from their children, calling Mexicans rapists and criminals, wanted people to give them their citizenship information for reasons we don't even know, was very alarming to a lot of people. How could you convince that person to... Uh, partake in the census. I think it was going to be very, very difficult to do yeah. so if that question was on it. The good thing is the Supreme Court did not allow, in a very rare and really, really significant victory for democracy, one of the only good things the Supreme Court has done in the last few decades <laughs> is they did not allow this question. Because again, you're talking about, bro, you're racist. Mm -hmm. This was so obvious. This was a situation where John Roberts almost basically said to the Trump administration, bro, you're racist. I mean, like even John Roberts, the same guy who gutted the Voting Rights Act, said it was so obvious that he said that um, the Trump administration's reason for this question, in his words, John Roberts said, the rationale, quote, seemed to have been contrived, which is a polite way of saying you're lying. They will lie. You, exactly. you actually said to me multiple times, you thought they, they were going to strike it down. Yeah. I thought there was no way. Yeah, I mean, because once you got into the, the emails and the, the testimony, you could see that these reasons that they put forward for the inclusion of this question was bullshit. It was lie they were lying. See, this is private, Eric. Nobody's listening. It's not a live yeah, stream. Yeah, don't worry. Yes, nobody's, oh, yeah. nobody's hearing you. Those, were, stream, those, were, okay. sim those were simply lies. And, you know, we've now seen papers by this guy. We won't get too much of this guy named T Thomas Hoffler, um, who was kind of the, the guru of Republican um, uh, gerrymandering. And he wrote that inclusion of question and doing all of these things um, would benefit Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. There's, this is in a document, you know, this is in a document. I think Supreme Court saw that and said, all right, this is not something that we can, we can countenance. And, uh, you know, so, but there is real fear in certain communities. Let me just be honest, real fears in the Hispanic community. If you're in a mixed, um, mixed family of documented and undocumented people, and given what this administration has done, you're gonna be concerned about raising your right. hand and being counted if you are, in fact, a documented person, if you've got an undocumented person in your, um, in your family, in your, in your household. And so what we've got, I've been to Texas five times to talk about um, this issue and to try to reassure people that there are ways in which we can um, protect them so that they are, are appropriately counted, because as Ari says, there has been a historic undercount of communities of color, um, urban communities, and that is the basis upon which these federal funds are, are doled out and the way in which we determine how many congressmen, for instance, um, each, state, uh, each state will have. But it's important to note that question is not on the census. Not on the question, right. Gotcha. The census is confidential. Right. You may hate Donald Trump, but he cannot see your citizenship status on the census. And this is about much more than whether you, Trump, you, you, you trust Trump with your data. This is about economic and political power being allocated fairly for the next decade and beyond. Right. Gotcha. Um, okay, so I like want to talk to you guys forever, and I'm like, maybe we can like do this again <laughs> sometime. <laughs> if you guys want to hang out again. But um, I want to ask just a couple more things before we wrap up. So, um, Ari, you were um, telling me about Eric's family history. You want to like sort of how you've been, Set like sort up. of popping up, yeah. alley oop, and then he slams it down. Um, <laughs> tell me, what's your family history? Uh, well, I think the thing we're talking about is that uh, in 1963, uh, two black students integrated the University of Alabama. It's a place, famous scene where George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door. Robert Kennedy, Attorney General of the United States, Dick Katzenbach, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, who's down there in Tuscaloosa, escort these two black students into uh, the University of Alabama. And one of those two black students was my late sister-in-law, um, Vivian Malone. Wow. Um, Let's and for Vivian Malone. well, yeah. And it yeah. was an interesting thing that Vivian mm. Malone's brother-in-law becomes the first black attorney general. The person who escorted her through the door, Nick Katzenbach, is somebody who I got to know. We served on a corporate board um, together. He became a friend. And so the world you know, is, is, is very, very, very small. Um, and it's uh, something I'm very proud of. It's something that uh, 
I consider her, you know, civil rights royalty. And so that's my connection uh, to her. And, it, it, you know, it, they're a family been in Alabama for generations. And Vivian could not understand why she was not allowed to go to the University of Alabama, her state school. You know, th- you know how, how sick this is? In, some, in certain southern states, um, you had a qualified uh, black kid who wanted to go to the state university, and there's no basis to really kind of say you can't go. They would actually pay your tuition to go to Howard, to go to you know, Columbia, Harvard, whatever, just so that you wouldn't try to go to the school in your state. They'd spend state money to send you to a private institution outside the state. Vivian said, well, I want to go to U of A. I want to go to Alabama. I want to go to Tuscaloosa. And uh, George Corley Wallace said, we're not going to let it happen. Bobby Kennedy said, we are going to have it happen. And uh, she was my sister-in-law. And, Vivian Malone. It's amazing. And what, one of the most um, powerful scenes, I think, in my book is when I talk about when you went to Selma, Alabama, where John Lewis nearly died marching for voting rights, and you went to Brown Chapel Church, Mm -hmm. the church where Martin Luther King and so many others spoke, which was the focal point of the civil rights movement. You went there after Barack Obama's election as the first black attorney general, and you were introduced by George Wallace's daughter, who voted for Barack Obama. That still to this day gives me chills. And I think it's something you want to keep in mind. You know, the change is possible. Um, just because things are not great right now, um, you know, we can't give up. You know, you can't give up. Um, I don't want to hear people say, I'm tired, I'm worn out. You know, this is too hard. Uh, there's a bunch of patriots who formed this nation and took on the mightiest empire in the world, you know, and beat it. There's a bunch of folks who um, got their skulls cracked, gave their lives so that we might have the opportunities that we now have. You can't have Dr. King, John Lewis, um, saying, I'm tired. It's too hard. I'm worn out. There's no way, there's no possible way of change. I mean, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But here's the reality. It doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when people like us, people like you, put their hands on that arc and pull it towards justice. But change is possible. It's not promised. It's not um, etched in stone that it's going to happen. It only happens when people like us, regular people, decide that we're sick of the status quo, we're stick, sick of the inequalities, we're sick of the injustice, and we're going to make the changes that are um, necessary. So between now and November of this year, I don't want to hear anybody say, I'm tired, it's too hard, he's too, you know, he's, Trump's got in my head or whatever. No, everything is possible. And our history demonstrates that. We're not a nation yet where we need to be, but yet we're better than we were 50 years ago and better than we were 50 years before that. To get to the place where we need to be, it means that we have to be committed, we have to understand the issues, uh, and we've got to be focused on elections especially at every level, not simply who's going to be president, although, as I said, this one's existential, um, but, uh, you know, who's going to be your city council person? Who's going to be your state rep? Who's going to be governor? Who's going to be congressman? Who's going to be senator? All those elections um, should engage each and every one of us. Thank you so much. This has been such an honor. <clears throat> Give it up for Eric Holder and Ari Berman. amazing. I'm going to have to make that happen again because I have so many more questions and oh my goodness. But um, we're going to post, we'll post like contact links like all on the line and NDRC. Um, That was just absolutely fabulous and enlightening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, We're also going to post the link to this talk so that will be available again if there was something you needed repeated. And um, tomorrow night we have an amazing, another amazing um, event with Gloria Steinem and Amanda Wynn. So thanks so much for being with us, and uh, we'll be in touch. (laughs) Bye. Thank you. Bye.